everybody, and welcome to today's Barnes Takeout. I'm Amy Gillette and a collections researcher here at the Foundation. Now today we're going to travel into room 19 at the Barnes and focus on this painting at the edge of the wall entitled Acrobat with Two Dogs by the French painter Georges Rouault, who was born in 1871 in Paris. And before we zoom into this particular picture, let's take a look at how it fits into this ensemble at the Barnes. So as you might know, um, Albert Barnes, when he was arranging his paintings, didn't display them according to when they were made or where they were made, but really just on the basis of formal relationships. And we can see perhaps most immediately the figure of the acrobat echoed in Picasso's own acrobat and Harlequin over here. Her, um, her frontal pose, you can maybe see, um, again, iterated up here in this image by Henri Matisse, who studied under the painter Gustave Moreau, actually, with Rouault. Um, perhaps we can see even the two dogs, one here, one here, in this image up here by Italian painter uh, Giorgio de Chirico of his dog named Baby. And then this idea of uh, formal relationships did continue into objects as well, where perhaps in this chair down here, we can see the rather like rigid or erect pose and the splayed legs and our acrobat or likewise for the and iron down here. And so with that being said, let's go in and take a closer look of acrobat with two dogs. So here we are, um, the acrobat in question, we can see she's standing upright, downcast eyes, hands on hips, two straight legs. I say that it's a she, because um, the alternative title when Barnes purchased this painting was given as clowness or female, uh, female clown. And if we zoom in, well, let's look at the dogs first. Here's one sort of curled up, maybe sleeping down there in black, another one sitting upright, almost perhaps like a guardian in white. We can go in and see her costume. I love these areas of red up here at the top of her leotard with this gold kind of picked out almost as if it's light shining through stained glass or perhaps even like gold glinting on a mosaic icon or something. And we can see again her heavily made up eyes, perhaps a bit of rouge on her cheeks over here. Um, and then going over here, we can see the artist's signature twice, um, G. Rouault down up here, down here, plus the year 1924. So we know precisely when he did paint it. Now, in terms of how it looks, Rua has a very distinctive style um, that he's applied to this particular picture. And that took shape according to a number of different conditions. First, he was born in Paris to a working class family. And when he was still a young man, um, prior to the turn of the 20th century, he trained as a stained glass maker. And that gives a lot of context for how we see, say, these black outlines around her costume, around her face and her legs, even in the dog, um, the interior, probably backstage room where we see her standing. It's like the, the lead that would surround the panes of glass that constitute a Gothic window in a cathedral. But as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, he did also train with the symbolist painter Gustave Moreau along with Henri Matisse in the 1890s at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. And Moreau um, was a symbolist painter, which means that he and his symbolist colleagues, uh, Odilon Redon, for instance, sought to for their art to give kind of this visible cloaking to invisible ideas with a big eye. And so art was really supposed to be a, a visual manifestation between the transcendental, the personal, broadcast to the world. And, and so this combination of medievalism and symbolism, which were bunched up categories, is what we start to see coming across in Rouault's clowness here. Now, Moreau passed away in the year 1898, and Rousseau, um, Rousseau was devastated and ended up turning increasingly toward his Roman Catholic spirituality. And this development was given, a, it was pushed into full force, it seems, in the year 1905, when Rousseau was wandering around, and he wrote that he saw an old clown sitting in a corner of his caravan in the process of mending his gaudy and sparkling costume. So this exhausted performer really putting on his own kind of 
Baal in order to perform for the crowds. And Rouro and this old clown saw a humanity and inner light nevertheless shining forth, um, a lot like to his mind, the marginalized people to whom Christ ministered in the Gospels and the biblical tradition, and actually also quite a lot like a poem entitled The Old Acrobat by Charles Baudelaire, who was a famous commenter on modern life. And at this moment in 1905, Rouro wrote, I saw quite clearly that the clown was me, was us, nearly all of us. This rich and glittering costume, it is given to us by life itself. We are all more or less clowns. We all wear a glittering costume. So we have the stained glass references to Byzantine icons as forms of art that can kind of image forth this essential spirituality. And I should note as well on um, kind of on the same topic that it wasn't just the Western tradition that Ruo and his contemporaries were looking to, but um, works of art from Sub-Saharan Africa, from Islam, from Oceania, that they believed also were able to give um, particularly articulate shape to inner force, vitality, a kind of authentic spirituality. So Ruo is working with that, but do you remember that um, 1905 was when he had this revelation of the of the old clown and actually did paint this particular painting later, almost 20 years later when he was over 50 in the year 1924. And the massive humanitarian crisis of World War I um, in which whether modernity was a good thing was certainly put to test, um, did shape his art thereafter as it did um, pretty much every artist, I would say. And another component that we can now see in his acrobat with two dogs was his friendship with a philosopher named Jacques Maritain, um, another person who took his Roman Catholicism very seriously and indeed worked in the tradition of the great medieval philosopher Thomas Aquinas, um, a scholastic philosopher who was active in the middle of the 13th century. And 19, the year 1920, Jacques Maritain, the philosopher, published a book that he'd really formed in conversation with Georges Rouault, among a couple of other artists. It's called Art and Scholasticism. And in it, Maritain um, said that modern sacred art really ought to look modern. And he wrote, and I'm going to quote, there are many references in Art and Scholasticism to the Middle Ages. They are le legitimate because the Middle Ages are relatively the most spiritual period to be found in history. But time is irreversible, and the example will best serve as an analogy. The same principles will have to be realized today, but in an entirely new manner, which is very difficult to foresee. So I think what we've got in the end is an exaltation of the figure here, Clowness, as an agent of unveiling hidden truth roughly in terms of the light of Gothic glass or a Byzantine icon, but updated for perhaps people who might find themselves on kind of a wash in all of the upheavals of modern society, whether they're um, on the fringes of it or even it's sort of interior kind of um, on the fringes as well. And Ruo did write, and now I'm going to read you his own words, a truth hidden at the core of our being sometimes makes us have a premonition of true beauty, true grandeur. The most noble subjects are humbled by a low spirit, while modest and simple realities are raised up and magnified. And what he writes, actually, you know, thinking in terms of giving modern form to sacred art, a contemporary artist, Gehinda Wiley, who works in paint as well as stained glass, and one of whose works was actually featured at our recent exhibition, 30 Americans. And as his subject matter, he picks usually youth of color, um, young men and women of color that he finds on, on city streets and puts them in stained glass windows as well as huge heroic paintings. And he wrote about his glass, the resplendent light is about being powerful in the world, glowing literally, 
And if art can be at the service of anything, it's about letting us see a state of grace for those people who rarely get to be able to see be seen that way. So that's it for today's takeout. Thank you so much for watching and may your own light shine. I'm Tom Collins, Neubauer Family Executive Director of the Barnes Foundation. I hope you enjoyed Barnes Takeout. Subscribe and make sure your post notifications are on to get daily servings of art. Thanks for watching and for your support of the Barnes Foundation.